Good morning. It's good to see you in the Vidalia Church of God today. If you would stand with us, let's take a few minutes and raise a hallelujah. Welcome the Savior into the place today. Lift up his name because he is worthy to be praised. Theology of a song, and that song was saying, sing a little louder. And I got to thinking about that scene in Revelation 19. And John said, I heard what sounded like the voice of a great multitude saying, hallelujah. And so if you don't like it loud, you might have trouble in heaven. I don't know. I will pray for you. 
I'm sure God will, God will, when he gives you a brand new body, you can take it. But I don't mind getting loud for Jesus. And I don't like to get loud just to hype something up. But I want to tell you, he's worthy of my, my exuberance. He's worthy of my best. And I want us to lift our hands one more time. Let's raise that hallelujah. Would you join me? Hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Blessed be the name who is worthy of all of our breath, of all of our energy, of all of our enthusiasm. We bless you today in this service. We come to praise you, Jesus. We give you glory. We give you praise. Amen. Let's just clap to the Lord again. And thank you, praise team, for opening up this wonderful truth to us today. Amen. As you look to the screen, we're going to pray for those that need prayer. Betty Carter has a very serious heart surgery this week. Uh, and let us pray for Betty and ask the Lord to touch her and be with her and strengthen her in every way. You see uh, the needs before us. Little Brady is just doing wonderfully well since we first started praying for him this week. Can you say praise the Lord? Praise the Lord for that. And so, so many uh, in need. Um, Marilyn asked for prayer for her brother, Lanny. But as you read over those names, uh, just continue to pray. Ryan had his PET scan this week. And uh, uh, it was, I, I would say it this way. I hope Jill and Ryan wouldn't mind me saying this way. It was as good uh, as they could have expected as far as um, the, you know, still there, but it's better. Uh, some areas are better. They'll find out more next week, but uh, still having to go through everything that they're going through yet. And, and that being said, uh, it was uh, there, there were some areas in that report that were better. So we give God praise for that. I'm sure that you do. So in praying today, the Bible says always for us to give our request to God with thanksgiving. How many of you got something or someone you can be thankful for? If nothing else, we're thankful for him. So let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, as the body of Christ today, we pray for one another that we may be healed. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man or a woman is powerful and effective, you said. And I thank you, Lord, for the prayers that are going up right now. The, the prayers of faith. The prayers of your people calling out to you on behalf of their brothers and sisters. Or some are standing here in need of prayer themselves. And as they call out to you, I pray they will be healed and helped and strengthened and encouraged today in every way. Heal and minister across this body. These names, the friends and, and family of our church, we give you all the praise for all that you're doing and going to do. In Jesus' name. And the church said, Amen, and you may be seated. God bless you is my prayer. Uh, thank you so very, very much for giving week in and week out. You are a blessing to me. And as the Apostle Paul was commending the church at Philippi. You know, they were, it was a church that was not wealthy. It was one of the least wealthy churches in the New Testament. And Paul said, you gave out of your poverty. You gave out of your lack. And in 2 Corinthians, uh, he wrote that about them in chapter 8. Uh, trying to spur the Corinthians on, which was a wealthier church. And, uh, you know, I don't know where we stack up financially in the world uh, scale. of, uh, But I know uh, as far as the world, we are wealthy indeed. And uh, we... Uh, uh, express the wealth that God has given us by the way that you tithe and give. Regardless of what you have, God has blessed you and you are being a blessing. Amen? And uh, so this coming Sunday, I'm excited to announce to you that uh, Ray Dawson is going to be our guest speaker. And talking to Ray, he, he preached for you, I think, probably about 10 years ago. You know, time flies. But uh, Ray and Pam are going to be with us uh, next week. Uh, this coming Sunday in our service and we just uh, he is a friend to me he is uh, a preacher and if I could describe him in one word it would be preacher and you're going to be blessed by his ministry he has a, 
his and Pam's ministry. So be here next Sunday morning, and let's look forward to a great day in the Lord. God's going to touch us together. So let's turn our tents to the screen, and uh, let's get the video announcements for this coming week. Good morning. We are glad you're here to worship with us today. If you're a guest here, we want to connect with you. Fill out the connect card on the queue in front of you, scan the QR code on the bulletin you just received, or visit our webpage at vadeachurch.org and click connect at the top right corner. We have a gift waiting for you in the foyer. We look forward to seeing you at our next service. Tuesday night at 6.30 is our monthly Golden Nugget Fellowship. We will meet in the Smith Center. Barbecue will be provided. You bring side dishes, desserts, and drinks. We'll see you Tuesday night for Golden Nuggets. Our girls are having a tea party. It's scheduled for 10 a.m. Saturday, September the 24th at the Wickstrom. Parents, please remember to RSVP online at vidayachurch.org slash events. Calling all men, Saturday, September the 24th is our work day. We need your help to complete several projects. We will start our day in the Smith Center with breakfast biscuits for all at 9 a.m. Go by the Welcome Center and pick up a handout listing the things we are going to be working on. This list will assist you on what tools you may bring or work clothes to wear. Should you have any questions, see Brother Nathan Bell or Pastor Merritt. Calling all you, we need you. Saturday morning, October the 1st, Randy Student Ministries will be at Imago Day in Lines from 10 a.m. to 12 p.m. This is a service project, so make sure you have your work clothes on. For more information, talk with Pastor Brandy. You can stay up to date with all of our church events by following our social media platforms. Those are the announcements for the week, but should you need Pastor Merritt or the staff, give us a call. Phone numbers are in your bulletin. And most of all, we look forward to seeing you at the next service. Have a good week. Why don't you stand with us again?
Would you just thank him this morning for that breakthrough? That song said, you alone, you alone, Father, can create a breakthrough.
just thank you today for grace that is all surpassing, sufficient. I thank you, Lord, for saving me, saving us, Lord, turning us from sinners into saints, all because of you, because of your love and grace. Thank you, Father. We give you all the glory, all the praise for eternal life in our hearts and lives. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Let's take some time this morning. You know, the Bible teaches us to greet one another. That's a scriptural admonition. Let's do that together. Just turn around and start greeting some people. Let them know you love them. Pray for them. Encourage one another, would you please? Praise the Lord. house of the Lord with you today. If you're a guest with us, please go by the Welcome Center if you haven't done that. And we appreciate so very much your being with us today. I uh, want to continue the message series that I began last week, uh, looking at the life of Job, that I'm calling Turnaround. God can give a turnaround in your life, in our nation, wherever we need a turnaround. Now, a turnaround is a sudden change that results in a new direction. A turnaround is a sudden change that results in a new direction. It's a reversal. I like to call it reversing God's uh, or, or reversing life's reversals when God gets involved. Uh, it's a U-turn uh, in your life. But the turnarounds I'm specifically talking about in this series of messages is when God steps in and he takes what was meant for evil, for harm, for destruction, and he takes that and turns it into good. Something beautiful in your life. And so we're going to look at the life of Joseph this morning in just a minute, but uh, the New Testament passage that I gave you last week that just kind of sums up that act of turnaround is Romans 8 and 28. When Paul is writing, he's talking about all that we go through and suffer in this world. He said the world groans, we groan, we don't know, always know what to pray for, how to pray. He, he talks about in that chapter 8 that we have tribulations and persecutions and peril and nakedness and, and sword and all of those things we go through. But he makes this great statement in, uh, in Romans 8 and 28. He says, and we know. He's not saying that it might be or maybe so, but we know so. And we know, <coughs> excuse me, that in all things, everybody say all things. God works for the good of those who love him, who are the called according to his purpose. So as we turn our attention to Joseph this morning in the book of Genesis, there's 13 chapters at the end of Genesis that completes the book about Joseph, a patriarch. We're going to look at his life and how God gave Joseph, a great turnaround in his life. Joseph's testimony to his brothers is exactly what we sung this morning already in this, in this song worship. It's in Genesis 50 and 20. It's a companion verse to Romans 8 and 28. It's just the Old Testament version. And, and uh, Joseph says to his brothers, you intended to harm me. But God intended it. What? What you intended to harm me with. God intended it for good. To accomplish what is now being done. The saving of many lives. So, so how did God 
give Joseph such a turnaround using such harmful, destructive intentions by his brothers. Well, the key <clears throat> to Joseph's turnaround, last week Job's key was when he prayed for his friends. The key to Joseph's turnaround is when he forgave his brothers. And that's the message today. That's where we're driving to in this message, when Joseph forgave his brothers. Father, we open our hearts to your word. I pray that not only will you enable me to speak and minister and preach the word today, but that you would enable all of us to have ears to hear what the Spirit is saying to the church, to us individually as your people, and touch the hearts of us all that we can acknowledge you as the one who can take what was intended for evil and turn it into good, and we'll thank you for it and praise you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. There is an interesting theme in the book of Genesis where we pick up the story of Joseph. And that interesting theme in the book of Genesis, one of the themes, is how not to treat a brother. How not to treat a brother. We open up the pages of God's word in the first family. And Cain killed Abel, his brother. John tells us in 1 John 3 and 12 that why did he do that? Well, because Cain's, his intentions were evil. He killed his brothers because his ways were evil and his brother's ways were good. And really, he, uh, he committed the first act of persecution. Cain was the first murderer and Abel was the first martyr. And uh, God said, where is your brother? And because God cares about how we treat each other and how we don't treat each other in this case. And then we look at Ishmael and Isaac. Ishmael ridiculed Isaac, mocked him, made fun of him. Ishmael was the son of Abraham and Hagar. He was born of what flesh can do. He was born of the natural. Isaac was born of the promise. He was born because of only what God can do. And um, it says to us that the natural man cannot receive the things of the Spirit of God. Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 2. They, they are foolishness to him or her. They can only be spiritually discerned. And, and Ishmael could not discern that. He was of the natural. And the message to us is, brothers, you must be born again. And sisters, too. You must be born again if you are going to live in the promise, if you're going to live in the power of that new birth. And then we come to Jacob, how that he deceived his brother Esau, cheated him to get his birthright, to get the blessing of the, of the father of the firstborn. And uh, through his scheming, mistreated his brother Isaac. And here's the message. Even though God gave Jacob a great turnaround and named him Israel, prince with God, not a deceiver, we, we don't have to scheme to get what we can only get by faith. Faith is not scheming. I, I can get kind of upset at charlatans who are trying to scheme and scam people out of their money. I believe in giving. I, I believe you ought to kill. Amen? But I don't believe you got to scheme and scam to get what comes by faith and trust. But it's how a brother doesn't treat a brother. And then we come to these last brothers and how that Joseph's brothers so mistreated him. They envied him and, and hated him. They betrayed him. They hated him so much. And, and, and how not to treat a brother. Now, that's a, that's a very important message for us. But I'm going to give you another important message. And that is how you do treat your brother and your sister when they have intended to hurt you and to harm you 
and to destroy you. How you treat people when they have mistreated you. And uh, the injustice that they bring against your life. And this is the message we receive from the Lord in the life of Joseph. Now, I didn't come to, to give you Bible, a Bible story today. You, you can tell those better than me. But I have come to preach to you the word of the Lord and to draw some principles for life, some truths from Joseph's life on how do you treat your brothers and sisters when they intended to harm you and how that God can give you a turnaround in your life and take every intention of that evil and turn it into something good, something beautiful, something purposeful. Uh, when you think, well, all is lost. No, it's not. Because God can pick it all back up and bring it all back together. Now, Joseph was the 11th son of Jacob. But he was the firstborn son for his mother, Rachel. And the Bible says that uh, Reuben was the firstborn of Leah, Rachel's sister. But because Joseph was the, even though he was the 11th, he was the firstborn of Rachel, it put him second in line for the birthright. Reuben was first, but it should something happen to Reuben, Joseph was second in line. He was the 11th son of Jacob, but he was, the Bible says, that he was Jacob's favorite, that he loved him more. And I just want to throw this in here. Favoritism is a sin. And if you'll study the dysfunction of the families in Genesis, every one of them had dysfunctions. So if you get worried and, and concerned about your family, just look at the families of the Bible. God had to do a lot of work in them. But because he was the favorite son, he made for Joseph this ornamental robe. It was, robe, it was a full length, uh, uh, full sleeved robe. And it was, uh, the Bible calls it a multicolored robe. I think the, the threads were intertwined and gave it the different colored hues. But it signified not that just that he got uh, Nordstrom and the other boys had to go to Goodwill. <laughs> but, but it signified that Jacob was saying, I'm putting you in authority. You really have the preeminence. You are the most important, Joseph. And his brothers resented him for it. You can imagine that. And on top of this jealousy and resentment they already had because of what Jacob was giving Joseph, Joseph also got these dreams from the Heavenly Father. Now, right or wrong, some argue, well, Joseph was being arrogant. He may have been. He was just 17 or younger. He was telling his dreams. And he said to his brothers, I had this one dream, and we were out uh, binding up the, the wheat, putting it in sheaves, and, um, and your 11 sheaves bowed down to my one sheep. Well, they knew that what that meant. You're, you're bigger than us. You're, you're the most important. And then he, he had another dream. And he said, I had another dream. And the, the, the moon and the sun uh, and the 11 stars all bowed. And that got close to mother and daddy there. And, and from the side of that coat, and the sounds of him telling those dreams over and again, their resentment, their anger, their hatred, their envy came to a boiling point. So much so that they couldn't even stand for Joseph to be in their sight. And at 17, you know, Joseph was kind of a tattler too. His father sent him to check on the 10 older guys who were the shepherds. They were over Shechem grazing all the sheep that the family owned and uh, to check on them. And sometimes Joseph would give a tattletale report. They were not doing like they ought to have been doing. They resented him for that too. And so here comes Joseph. They, he finally catches up to them in a place called Dothan because they had to move to different pastures. And they see him up. Uh, 
from a long distance coming <laughs> with ridicule and mockery. They said, here comes that dreamer. Let's, let's kill him. And, and let's see what becomes of his dreams then. In other words, they were going to put to death all that God had purposed for Joseph's life, or so they thought. And of course, when he got there, uh, Reuben, his oldest brother, if he had not intervened, they would have killed him on the spot. But to buy some time, he said, let's just throw him into this empty cistern, no water in it. And they threw him in this empty well. And they were so cold-hearted that they sat down. I, I, in my mind's eye, I can see Joseph pleading with them, have mercy on me. Don't do this to me. And they're so cold-hearted that it just fell on deaf ears. And they sit down and have a lunch while Joseph is begging for their mercy. And off in the distance comes a, a caravan of Ishmaelites or Midianites. They're descendants of the Ishmaelites. And they wave them down and they have this idea that instead of killing Joseph, they are going to sell him as a slave. So they sold him to the Midianites for 20, pieces, uh, 20 shekels of silver. And Joseph is shackled and taken by the Midianites uh, to the land of Egypt as they traveled there. The brothers, they take Joseph's beautiful ornamental robe that they had stripped off of him, killed a goat, dipped it in blood, took it back to Jacob, the father, and they said, is this your son's coat? And he just broke out in grief and mourning. He knew that a ferocious animal, no doubt, a wild beast had attacked Joseph and killed him. And the Bible says that Jacob was so in grief that he mourned for days and days and days. Now, I can't imagine the cold-heartedness of these brothers and these sons that they would do this to Joseph and to, to uh, uh, Jacob. And shackled as a slave, they make their way uh, to... Um, Toward Egypt. I, I can't imagine, I can't imagine the rejection that Joseph must, must have felt. I, I don't know of a greater hurt than the hurt of rejection. Uh, you, you know, if some of you may have experienced that. May, maybe the rejection of a spouse or of children or parents or friends, close friends, or even a church. Just that rejection. One of the the most grievous hurts that anybody can go through. I, uh, Kim and I, we, we like the Isaacs. Now, we like contemporary gospel music, but we like the Isaacs. Uh, I think they're, they're probably the most talented, one of the most talented uh, vocalist groups and, and musicianal, uh, musicians in, in any field of music, in any genre of music. But Lily Isaac gives her testimony, and I'd heard her give it, give it before, and I, I listened to it again in preparation for this message, and she talked about how that her parents were both Polish Jews. They were arrested <coughs> in, uh, in Poland, put in Nazi concentration camps, and um, it just as young adults. <coughs> Honey, I need a bottle of water. Would you mind getting that for me? <coughs> just as a... Uh, just as young adults, they didn't know each other, even though they grew up in the same hometown. They survived the, um, the concentration camps. Uh, miraculously, that's another testimony. They got together uh, after the liberation by the Allies, and they were um, uh, married, and Lily was born. They moved to New York. Lily said she grew up as an agnostic. They, didn't, they were Jewish, but they didn't really believe anything. They didn't go to synagogue just uh, by a name only, that they were Jewish. Well, she started her musical career with a friend. She had sights set on Broadway, but she met the, this uh, Kentucky hillbilly who just happened to be the son of a Pentecostal, thank you, the, the son of a Pentecostal preacher, a Church of God preacher. And they got married. She said that she never went to church. They never, they had never been to church in her life. 
But his brother passed away and they did a memorial service. She went and sat on the back row of the service. And something about that, she felt the presence of God for the first time in her life. And she began to just weep and weep and weep. Didn't know why. But she accepted Jesus as she heard uh, the father of her brother-in-law memorialize him in that service and talk about God and Christ and how he could save. Well, a cousin of hers found out about it, sent word back to her parents, her Jewish parents, that she had fallen off the deep end and was involved in a cult and was praying and going to church and talking about Jesus. And her parents called her up and said to her, we're ashamed of you. And we don't want to ever see you again. You're not welcome, rather, in this home as long as you are in this nonsense and living in this nonsense. And she said it hurt her deeply. But she said the point of all that was, it was in their rejection that she found Jesus so close. And that's what we find in our lives. You know, the Bible says, David did, though my mother and my father forsake me, the Lord will receive me. And the Lord is close to the brokenhearted. And he saves those who are crushed in spirit. And God will give you a turnaround in your hurt. He'll give you a turnaround with his love and his closeness and his comfort that you would not have otherwise known. If you had not gone through that kind of rejection and that kind of hurt. And, and Joseph came to know that closeness of God in his re rejection, and in his loneliness, and in all of his hurt. Because when those Midianite traders got him down to Egypt, they, they put him on the option block. In a language he could not understand. They began to bid for him in a... Egyptian official, a captain of the guard, he was in the very, uh, uh, the very government of Pharaoh himself. He hit, had the highest bid for Joseph and he bought, bought him and he took him as his slave back to his house. And the Bible says this in Genesis 39 and verse 2. I mean, how did Joseph handle all this? How did he handle the rejection and the loneliness and the betrayal and the hurt? The Bible says in Genesis 39 and 2, it was because the Lord was with Joseph. And that's the whole point. When my father and my mother do forsake me, the Lord will receive me. And what seems to be the greatest rejection, oftentimes it's at that moment that the one who was despised and rejected by men for us all brings us in closer than we would have ever known before. And the Bible says in Genesis 39 and 2 and following, the Lord was with Joseph so that he prospered. Get this. And he lived in the house of his Egyptian master. When his master saw that the Lord was with him and that the Lord gave him success in everything he did, Joseph found favor in, the, in his eyes and became his attendant. At Potiphar put him in charge of his household and he entrusted in his care everything that he owned. Notice this, beginning in verse 5. That from time to time, he put him in charge of his household and all that he owned and the Lord blessed the household of the Egyptian because of Joseph. Everybody say because of Joseph. The Lord blessed everything that Joseph put his hand to, including this pagan worshiper of false gods. The blessing of the Lord was on everything Potiphar had, both in the house and in the field. So Potiphar left everything in the hands of Joseph's care. With Joseph in charge, he did not concern himself with anything else except for the food he ate. How many of you like to have somebody like that in your life? other than your spouse that you've abused. And here's the first turnaround principle that I, I just want to share with you this morning from the life of Joseph. 
God's presence with you while you in your worst pain, in your worst hurt, will impact the people around you. It'll, it'll impact everything around you. It'll give you a new perspective in life. But people who don't know Christ, they will begin to see that the Lord is with you. And, and they will begin to feel even the blessings of God that permeate from your life. Isn't it amazing that because the Lord was with you, even in your pain, that he can bless the people, your children, your, your parents, your work associates. Everything Joseph touched was successful because the Lord was with him. And when the devil and your enemies and your brothers and sisters and maybe your church family or your own children, when they do the worst for you, God is with you. God is working in you and through you and for you. And he can take the worst of that and turn it for good so that everybody can see that the God that you serve is a God who is the God of turnaround. And we can say if God is for us, who can be against us? That the one that spared not his own son but delivered him up for his all, how shall he not with him freely give us all things? Now, you follow Joseph's life. It was up and it was down. And uh, the Lord is blessing him. He knows that the Lord is with him. But Potiphar's wife became infatuated with him. You remember this story. And Potiphar's wife set her uh, ambition to uh, make a proposition to Joseph. Not just one, but many times, day after day. Because Joseph was... The steward over the house of Potiphar, he was there in the house with Potiphar. And she made her overtures day after day. And Joseph said, listen, I just want to tell you, with me in charge, your husband, my master, he doesn't concern him with anything. He has put everything under my uh, management except for you. And he said, God forbid, that, that how can I do such a wicked thing and and commit such a sin against my God, not against Potiphar. And the Bible says Joseph refused to go to bed with her. One day they were in the house by themselves. How many of you know that many times the enemy can get you in a setup? And they were there alone in the house. And the Bible says that she grabbed hold of Joseph to embrace him. And when he did, when she did, the Bible says that he left his robe that he was wearing, his coat rather that he was wearing, and he fled for his life. And that is some good advice, male or female. You don't need to deliberate in that situation. You don't need to talk about how you feel and you don't feel about them. You need to run. As a matter of fact, Paul wrote to Timothy and he said, you need to flee. You need to flee from fornication. And Joseph left his coat there in her, in her hands. And, of course, a woman scorned, you know, the Shakespeare quote. And she began to scream. And she accused Joseph, obviously, of uh, assaulting her and raping her. This infuriated Potiphar, who happened to be the captain of the guard, who most scholars believe was probably over the prison itself. And the Bible says he was in such a, an infuriated an infuriated rage that he put Joseph in the king's prison. Now here is Joseph. He's gone from favored son, he's gone to Potiphar's house as a slave, and now he's gone into the dungeon of an Egyptian prison. And the Bible says in Genesis chapter 39 beginning in verse 20, now what's this, the ups and downs of Joseph, but while Joseph was there in prison, I know that's not on the screen, but as you follow along with me in Genesis 39. But while Joseph was there in the prison, the Lord was with him. He showed him kindness and granted him favor in the eyes of the prison warden. And the warden, or so the warden, put Joseph in charge of all that those, of all those held in the prison. And he was made responsible for all that was done there. Watch this. The warden paid no attention to anything under Joseph's care because the Lord was with Joseph. 
and gave him success in whatever he did. You can't get too deep for the presence of God. Have you ever read Psalm 139? If I make my bed in hell, he's there. You can't get deep enough and low enough that God's presence is not there when you get there. And, and as we look at him in the prison, you remember the story of two of the king, Pharaoh's uh, attendants, his cupbearer and his a baker, chief baker, and you know they were very important because in that culture uh, many would try to assassinate them through poisoning and the Bible uh, tells us that these two guys were in prison. They offended the Pharaoh some way. Maybe he got sick. I'm not sure, but he puts them in prison and he's examining and investigating what happened. And these two guys have dreams. You remember this story? They both have different dreams. The baker had a dream. The the cupbearer, and they, they are looking sad, and Joseph is saying, what's going on? And they tell Joseph their dreams one at a time, and Joseph, through the Spirit of God, he is able to give them the interpretation. Told the baker that in three days, you're going to be executed. Told the cup, just cut into the chase. Told the cupbearer, in three days, you're going to be restored to the cupbearer's position for Pharaoh. Now, the cupbearer and the king, they, they were like your hairdresser ladies, and, uh, you know, or your barber guys, I mean, you just get really close. And, and they were just really close. And, and Joseph said, but I want you, he said this to the cupbearer. And, of course, it happened as he said. The baker was executed. The cupbearer was restored. But before the cupbearer left the prison, Joseph said, hey, look, just do me one thing. When you get there, back there, remember me. I, I didn't do anything to deserve this. I'm here out of betrayal and envy and jealousy. And the Bible says that the cupbearer did not remember Joseph. And sometimes we, you know, we just go through life and, 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 and we feel forgotten. We, we did the best on the job. We, I mean, we, we put into overtime. But have you ever been there? You just felt like you were overlooked. And, and it, it, was, it was bad enough that he was forgotten. But for two more long years... Joseph languished in that prison. Seconds became minutes, minutes became hours, and, and on and on, and months became then a year, and then two years, and all of a sudden, God gives Pharaoh a dream. He gives him two dreams, as a matter of fact. He is so troubled, he brings in all of those wise people that should be able to counsel him. And he gives, he said, I know this dream has meaning uh, for me. And he gives them the dream and they can't interpret it. And the cupbearer says, he has an aha moment. And he says, hey, I remember. I, I'm, I'm now reminded of my shortcomings, Pharaoh. There's a guy back there in the prison. He can interpret dreams. He told the baker what his dream meant. It happened just like he said. He told me what my dream meant and I was restored back to you. So they bring Joseph out. They shave him. They put him on some clean clothes and they bring him in before Pharaoh. Pharaoh tells him his dreams. And he had two dreams and, and the one was, was very foreboding and the other dream was very uh, encouraging. And Joseph said to Pharaoh in response, I hear you can interpret dreams. Can you tell me what these dreams mean? And, and, and Joseph just simply said, I, I, I don't have the ability. No one has the ability to interpret what the dream means, but God will give Pharaoh what the dreams mean. The dreams are one and the same. The, the first dream that you had means that there is going to be seven years of prosperity, economic uh, growth like you've never seen. Uh, there's going to be agriculture productivity like you've never seen. It's going to be seven years of that. But then following that, there's going to be seven years of devastation, financial downturn, and famine like this world has never seen. And Joseph said, this is what I advise the Pharaoh to do. What you need to do is find someone who is, who is sharp and discerning as a great manager. And you need to store away in silos these seven years of surplus. Because those seven years of famine are coming, and because of the surplus, God is letting you know that he is going to use this to bring about uh, survival, not only for you, but for the people 
of the world. And, and when Pharaoh heard this, he said, you're the man. He brings out a, a gold chain. He puts on him a robe. He, he gives him his signet ring. And he says, wherever you stamp this, this is the, this is the platinum credit card. And whatever you say, and I'm going to give you the, the chariot. And all of a sudden, Joseph finds himself, uh, just like in, in Great Britain today where you've got a, a monarchy, but you've also got a prime minister. Joseph finds himself as the prime minister of all of Egypt. A little bit different in the government structure, but he's second in command. And don't tell me that overnight... That suddenly, God cannot bring about a turnaround in your life. You say, I, I, I don't know if this will ever change. I don't know if my children will ever change. I don't know. I'm telling you, if you will understand that the Lord is with you, if you will trust Him, if you will look to Him, He'll bring about that turnaround that you need in your life. And I, I think about, you know, we look at Joseph's life, and I'm, I'm not here to suggest that you're going to be filthy rich. I'm not here to suggest that you're going to be uh, the, the CEO of the company. No, that's not the point. The point is this. Uh, I don't want to go through everything Joseph went through. Anybody else? I mean, he went through 13 years of betrayal. He went through 13 years of, 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 of slavery and as a prisoner. And I don't want to have to go through that, but the point is this. Whatever situation you find yourself in, God is able to take what was meant for evil. He's able to use that very thing and turn it into good, and everybody's going to see it. God's going to be glorified, and your life is going to be filled with fruitfulness and purpose again. Amen? The Bible says that that abundance came just as God said it would. Joseph was put in charge. He began to manage it. And in all of Joseph's losses, you know, all of his ups and downs, and especially his downs, it seems at this point, he never lost his faith in God. God blessed him. And God blessed him with his own family. And, and, and this leads into the second principle that, that I want to share with you this morning. It's in, it's in Genesis 41 and 50. Before the years of famine came, before there was an economic down, before anything else happened, Two sons were born to Joseph by Asenath, or Asenath, daughter of Potiphar, priest of On. Joseph named his firstborn Manasseh and said, It is because God has made me forget all my trouble and all my father's household. As prime minister, here he is. And then a second son was born to him named Ephraim, and he said, I name him Ephraim because it is because God has made me fruitful in the land of my suffering. God gave Joseph a twofold turnaround in the blessings of his son. And that's the second principle I just want to leave you with this morning. God will give you a twofold turnaround to be forgetful, forgetting those things that are behind us and reaching forth to those things that are uh, in front of us, present with us. And to be able to look back on your past. He, he named his, his son, the names are revealing. Manasseh, it means God has made me forget. That's what the name Manasseh means. Made me forget all my troubles and all my father's household. And, and, and the healing of these painful memories for Joseph did not mean that he couldn't recollect his past. But he was not trapped by that. He... he, he uh, didn't remember them with the pain and nursing hurt and nursing a grudge. Joseph was able to rise above those painful memories that he had. And so can you and I. There's no excuse to have a, a victim mentality. You know, I, I, this is not a cut to my dad. My dad, you've heard me tell this several times. My dad grew up very hard. He had a, a stepfather that was very harsh. To him and he grew up impoverished really and he said that when he was just uh, he couldn't finish his education his, his, his dad kept getting him out every spring to plow he said I was so small he was small in stature anyway and he said I'd have to reach up to hold on to the plow handles while my stepfather was getting over his hangover from the night before and my dad used to say this and, and this is not a cut to him but he used to say this if my daddy had lived, he died when he was three, I've often thought 
about how my life would have turned out. But see, the point of this story is this. If dad hadn't went through that, and then the next thing, and then the next thing, he may never have been the dad to us that God used him to be. Because he got saved, thankfully, just before I was born. And he worked hard. And he, he taught us to respect God and love God and respect one another. And, and, and that's the point. When you look back over your life, don't, don't ever think when you are the steps of a good man or woman are ordered of the Lord, don't ever think that God has not used every step of the way in your life for good. Amen? When he's with you, he's going to give you a twofold blessing. He's going to give you a Manasseh, and you're going to be able to look back on all of that. I'm going to just ask you to, this, this morning, what if, what if Joseph hadn't got that coat? What if he had not had those dreams? What if he had not been betrayed and sold into, uh, into uh, uh, Egypt? What if he hadn't gone to Potiphar's house? What if he hadn't gone to prison? What if he hadn't uh, get, been forgotten by the cupbearer? What if, what if? I'll tell you what if. He would not have rose to a place in God that not only was he able, not only was he able to help himself to be that influence in that strange land, but he was able to reach back over there and help his family get to where God wanted them to be as a matter of fact the whole world don't ever underestimate what God can do when he takes that that was intended for harm and he turns it into good and Ephraim it simply means the name God has made me twice fruitful in the land of my sufferings and we don't we don't have to wait for the circumstances to change uh, we, we don't need to say, well, what if? You know, I, I, I'm just going to lay it out here. This morning. I've heard pastors say, I haven't heard one say this in a long time. I'm waiting on my break. My goodness gracious, God is with you. You make the break where you are. God will bless what you have. You put it in his hands, and he'll bless everything that you put your hands to because he is with you, amen. Well, God has that double portion turned around. For our lives. You know, Jesus said to his disciples, he said, uh, very, very truly I say to you, the world is going to rejoice all the while you're mourning because I'm going to the cross. He said, but you will grieve, but your grief will turn to joy. And the thing that made you grieve is the thing that's going to make you rejoice. Can you, do you believe that this morning? When God can take all things and turn it to good, the abundance came and went. The famine came. I, I'm just cutting to the chase. Joseph and Egypt had enough grain because the famine hit the whole known world. Here comes the world. And all of a sudden, Joseph looks out one day, and there stood his ten brothers in the food line. And he recognized them. They don't recognize him because he's an Egyptian now. He's wearing... Uh, the customs of the Egyptians and they don't recognize him and you remember how that Joseph worked it so that he could get his young brother Benjamin back and eventually get his father and eventually get all 70 of them out of Canaan to be to survive and and to have the plenty that they needed to get through the famine the world was saved because God turned everything around for Joseph. Forty years now has passed. Forty years and Jacob has just died. They've had the funeral. And the brothers get to thinking, you know, I, I, I think Joseph just treated us well because of daddy. Daddy's gone and he, it's a powerful man. And he's going to get revenge on us just as sure as we are here. And, and here in their schemes and all of their trickery, the Bible says in Genesis 50 and 16, so they sent word to Joseph saying, your father left these instructions before he died. This is what you are to say to Joseph. I ask you, get this, to forgive your brothers the sins and the wrongs they committed in treating you so badly. Now please forgive the sins of your servants, of God, of your brother, of your father. When their message came to Joseph, he wept, the Bible says. 
His brothers then came and they threw themselves down before him and said, we're, we're your slaves. Just have mercy on us. Now let's look at it. I'm closing out here in Genesis 50, 19 through 20. But Joseph said to them, don't be afraid. Am I in the place of God? You intended to harm me, but God intended it for good. To accomplish what is now being done. The saving of many lives. So then, don't be afraid. I will provide for you and for your children. And he reassured them and spoke kindly to them. How a brother treats a brother. Who's done everything he can to destroy his dreams, destroy his life. I will provide for you. All because of their jealousy, Joseph went through so much. But notice his attitude. You know, there's a psalm that talks about Joseph that, that sometimes we, we don't think about. But the Bible says, you talk about what he suffered in prison. Psalm 105, 18 and 19. The Bible says they bruised his feet with shackles. His neck, neck was put in irons till what he foretold came to pass. Till the word of the Lord proved him true. God is going to have the last word concerning you and here's the final principle you know that God has given you a turnaround when you've let go and you move on you know when you've able to release that person to God no you're not saying oh it's okay you know it's okay no it, it don't matter no it does matter Joseph said to them you intended to harm me what you did was not right you intended to harm me but God took what you intended for evil. He took that very thing and he turned it into good. He released them. And that's what we have to do. And that's the key to our turnaround. It's the key to Job's turnaround, really. He prayed for his friends, but he forgave them. It's the key to so much. We can't move on until we let go. We're holding on to hurt and grudges. And, and I know this is painful sometimes because sometimes we've gone through some very painful experiences. But we can't move on into the Ephraim, into the, into the double portion blessing, in, in, into the land of fullness that God's got for us and our children, our family, our ministry, our church, because we're still holding on. And God has said, no, what they did was not all right, but just as God in Christ. For Christ's sake, forgave you. You forgive them. Release it. Release them. Cancel that debt. God will give you grace to love them more than you ever loved them before. That takes the grace of God, doesn't it? It really does. But that was the grace that God had for every one of us. You know, my mother, I remember when she took up needlepoint. Anybody does? Are you do, anybody do needlepoint out here? A few and I remember whenever that was, and she'd be doing her needlepoint. And on the other side of it, all these <laughs> strings there, all this thread. It was a mess. Didn't look like much to me. But then all, she'd turn it over. It was a beautiful picture, sometimes a scripture. And that's the way life is, isn't it? We, we're, we're looking underneath, and all we see is a mess. God is looking at what we see as a mess. He sees a masterpiece. God's able to take what was intended for evil and he's able to turn it into a miracle, really. Because he's the God of miracles to give us a new life, to give us a new start. Corey Ten Boone, who, like Lily and others, suffered so much, even more maybe. But the greatest thing she had to do was forgive when she survived that Nazi concentration camp and, and even on one occasion as she was preaching the guard that had her sister Be Betsy killed was in the service and as she's walking out the door she said I, I don't have it in me to forgive him and he stuck out his hand and he said that was a good message sister and she said, that's when I realized that it was the grace of God and the power and the goodness of God in my own life that what was intended for evil, I could give a message today that would 
help liberate many from the, from the bondage of sin and bitterness. I, I've got a wonderful little book. You've heard me say this before in my library by Corey. You may have it too. It's called Tramp for the Lord. I love that little book. It's old. It's about worn out. But in that book, Corey will say this. It, she quotes the, the poem that says it so well for me. My life is but a weaving between my God and me. I do not choose the colors. He, he worketh steadily. Oft times he weaveth sorrow and I in foolish pride. For yet he sees the upper and I the underside. Not till those looms are solid and the shuttles cease to fly. Will God unroll the canvas and show us the reason why. The dark threads are as necessary in the skillful weaver's hands as the threads of gold and silver in the pattern he has planned. You intended it for evil, but God intended it for good. Stand with me. Father, I thank you today for your word. I thank you for your grace, Lord. I thank you, Lord, for, for just being with us and for the turnaround that you give us if not anywhere else, in our own heart and in our own mind, to be set free from bitterness and hurt and resentment. I thank you, Lord, for the grace of God that's in Christ Jesus our Lord. And I pray for those that may be watching online or those that are here today. God, I'm just asking you to give them a turnaround. I don't know if they've been betrayed. I don't know if they've been rejected. I don't know, Lord, whatever they've gone through, whatever hurt, I'm praying, first of all, Father, that you would just turn it around for them today. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. I pray for that person that needs the greatest turnaround of all, and that's to be saved. To turn around and come to you, Lord Jesus. And right where they are sitting, maybe in their living room or standing in this congregation, I pray that they would pray this prayer with me right now. Father, I know that I'm a sinner. I know I can't save myself. I know that I don't deserve to be saved even. I know, Father, that you love me and you sent your son Jesus to die on that cross. And he rose again by your power so that I could have the promise and hope of eternal life. And Lord, right now, in my own heart and mind, I confess that you are the Lord of my life and I believe that you are God's son whom he raised from the dead and I give you my life from this day forward. If you prayed that prayer, the Bible says whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Would you just right now begin to thank the Lord for his salvation in your life and, and, and testify to that and, and let us know here at the church. And If you're here in this service, let me know. I, we, we want to walk this walk with you because we all come from the same place and we're all going to the same place in Jesus. And that is a life with him now and a life with him for eternity. Father, I thank you for touching today. I thank you for ministering today in this service. In Jesus' name, amen. I've asked the, the priest team to come back and sing Broken Vessels again. And, and we do get broken. We do get hurt. We do feel rejected at times. We do go through difficulties and hurt and pain. And, and this is not a... This is not something that I want you to feel like, you know, I, I don't want to step out. But if you need prayer, if there's something in your life, you say, Pastor, I need to turn around with my children, with my marriage, whatever that might be. We're going to pray for you. We're going to pray together at the close of this service. And as the praise team sings this one more time, just come from where you are. And let's just give it to God this morning. Let God do a great work a turn around in your life. Sing it, praise team, would you please? Sing it out, congregation.
Heavenly Father, we just thank you that you take all the pieces and all the threads and you put them all together and you make a wonderful masterpiece and we're made in your image to show forth your praise and your glory for our good and for the goods of, uh, good of others. I just thank you, Lord, as we leave this place today. That, Lord, we'd walk in the turnaround that you've given to every one of us in Christ Jesus our Lord. And we'll give you the praise and glory for it all in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. Have a wonderful week in the Lord.